No, I'm not making coffee this time because everybody criticized me for drinking decaf. Look, I have a caffeine sensitivity, okay? Guys, leave me alone. Stop bullying me about my choice of Folgers decaf. Stop it. Stop. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's talk about Linus Tech Tips. Hold on one second. All right, now we can talk about Linus Tech Tips. I got my headphones on. We're going to watch the uh, the LTT video here, and we're going to do a quick reaction. It just came out. It's 14 minutes long. And before we jump into this video, uh, why not hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out here. All right, let's get into it. The one month Linux gaming challenge has been as advertised, a challenge. And in part two, Luke and I are gonna be taking it to the next level by not just gaming on Linux, but by recording and streaming our gameplay to viewers on Twitch. Okay, so in this video, the challenge is to record and stream uh, uh, gameplay to Twitch. Um, that seems, I mean, to me, as a, as a Linux user, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, but we're going we're gonna to see how they do. With our desktop environment set up, Luke and I have a deceptively short pre-flight checklist of tasks to complete to be streaming ready. We'll need comms to chat and collaborate with our fellow creators, and software that's capable of capturing our gameplay, audio, and face cams. And obviously, we'll need the aforementioned audio interfaces and cameras both working. We both use Elgato key lights, which we've always controlled using Windows software, so we'll both oh. need to find a workaround for that. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to be an easy task at, at all. Uh, probably use your phone to do that, I would imagine. Immediately, I started overthinking things. Sometimes that's the problem with knowing just enough to be dangerous. I tried to apt get OBS, the industry standard for desktop capture and streaming in the terminal, only mm. to discover that Manjaro, Manjaro the yeah. Linux distribution that I'm using, doesn't come with apt because apt is for managing packages on Debian and related OSs. In the last video they did, he was complaining about having to go into the terminal to install stuff. I, but now his first instinct is to go into the terminal and install stuff. I find that a little confusing. If I were him on Manjaro, I would have just gone straight for the add remove software uh, feature because OBS should be right there, right? Like it should be, I'm pretty sure OBS is, is in the uh, Arch repo. In fact, let's look that up real fast. Yeah, okay, so if we type in OBS, it should be right there. It's in the official repo, so. Yeah, there's also a flat pack. Don't 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 use the flat pack <laughs> for, the, for OBS. I don't think that would be a good experience, but that's just me. Oops. Making life Oops. more difficult. Yeah. The message that comes up when you try to execute the command doesn't say, "Hey, you should probably be using Pac-Man, you dunce." <laughs> I mean, why would it, right? Like commands on Linux are literally just programs that are installed in your slash bin or slash usr slash bin directories on your hard drive. If the program apt isn't there, then it's just going to say command not found. Sometimes your shell might try and interpret what you're trying to do and try and offer a suggestion. But for the most part, commands on the Linux command line are literally just programs installed in your computer. And if they're not there, it's just going to say command not found. It tries to install some kind of dependency for apt, then just quietly fails and prompts you to do the same thing again when you try to use it. Wait, what? Let's let's see what uh, let's see what he's talking about here. Okay, sudo apt install, or I guess he's doing apt get install. Uh, OBS Studio. Let's see what error he gets. I'm just gonna run this command. Apt get not found. What are you, what are you talking about? Apt is not found. I'm not sure what error he's having. The good news is that upon launch, I was immediately relieved to find that it works exactly as expected, with some exceptions. For example, the NVENC new encoder doesn't show up as an option, which appears to be down to NVIDIA's poop-tastic drivers on Linux. Wait, what? I have NVENC encoding. Or is this like a new version of it? I don't know. I, I have it right out of the box. I'm not sure why you wouldn't, unless you don't have your drivers installed, but okay. Side note here, I always kind of assumed that the Linux community was grousing about NVIDIA primarily for their locked down proprietary approach to things. No. And that it had it's... less to do with the actual quality of the product. Oh no, it's it's Now crap. I properly understand that it is definitely both. Yeah. As mentioned, core product functionality from like a couple what is this of font? years ago is missing. 
The control panel looks like it's from 10 years ago, and the interface yeah. is kind of confusing. It's just obvious that the Linux software has never gotten the kind of TLC from the UX team that mm -hmm. the Windows software does. Of course, yeah. I mean, NVIDIA has been, I mean, notoriously terrible to work with, according to uh, some people who are also named Linus. <laughs> For me, acquiring OBS was no problem. I just got it from the package manager and it was all okay. Yeah. Once installed though, we noticed something. Window capture on Linux can be a little problematic. We couldn't seem to get it working at all at the start. I had an option for it, but it didn't work. And Linus didn't even have that. But a few days later, I tried it again for a different project and it worked just fine. I checked in with Linus hmm. and his did too. Neither of us know what might have fixed it, but that's cool, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes things just randomly work and then stop working or don't work and then start working. The bigger issue for me ended up being the software that just doesn't exist. If your peripherals have a manufacturer provided tool that is used to reconfigure RGB lighting or the lift off distance of your mouse or the sensitivity steps of your DPI button, you're going to be out then of luck get ready to install Windows in a virtual machine, oh. pass those devices through, no. configure them, and then hand them back over to Linux. Uh. It's extremely tedious and doesn't even remotely restore full functionality. Yeah, I've had slight issues like that. I have a Logitech Craft uh, mouse, and uh, this button on the with the thumb here, when you push down on it, just doesn't seem to... Uh, it, it, you can configure it to do things in Windows, and you can actually a, attach gestures to it as well. So, like if you, you know, hold down the thumb button and then do a gesture on Windows, it'll like, uh, you know, you can attach different um, things to that, but like uh, different applications, different commands to it. But uh, I've never tried. I like, I didn't even know that was a thing until like I had to install Windows on this machine. And Windows Update automatically installed the drivers for this thing. And then it's like, hey, here's some gestures you can add. And I'm like, what the heck is that about? I don't even care. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then also I have the Logitech Craft keyboard. And it has this like little dial on it. But I don't, I don't use that. So I just needed a chiclet keyboard because I got problems with my wrists. And I can't like do the proper stuff. So I have to use a chiclet keyboard on my desktop. I'm sure a lot of people will love that. <laughs> for example, don't expect to get a low battery warning for your G Pro wireless mouse. Really? And I it's get even that worse from, for my audio know. interface. The bad news about it is that, as far as I can tell, TC Helicon has given exactly zero thought to Linux whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But wait, That's there's typical. a solution. All I have to do is follow these simple instructions to download a random script off GitHub and run it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Downloading a random script off GitHub is always a good idea. No indication really. given whatsoever for how exactly to run a script. Even the process of downloading it was unintuitive. And I know GitHub is for developers and not for end users, but it's really hard to hide behind that shield when it took me less than two days to run into a situation where I had to use it. I mean, at that point, if GitHub is only for developers, then desktop Linux is only for developers. Anyway, I found a guide on how to run a script. I'm grateful for that, but I'm frustrated by the condescending tone. Unlike some silly operating systems, Astronix does not rely exclusively on extensions to determine what to do with a file. Permissions are also used. This means that if you attempt to run the shell script after downloading it, it will be the same as trying to run any text file. The .sh extension is there only uh, for your convenience to recognize that file. That is absolutely true. Linux doesn't give a crap about file extensions and most Unix uh, machines don't care at all about file extensions. That's just the nature of Linux. Windows is really the only one. Windows and DOS are like the only things that actually care about file, ex file extensions. On, on Windows, they usually hide the file extension by default. So it's like, I don't know, I'm not sure what Linus is complaining about here. I mean, my assumption that a file with a .sh extension would behave as I would expect it to and launch in some kind of script running application doesn't seem that unreasonable. 
Anyway, pompous tone aside, that contributor did help me figure out my GitHub download. So it turns out that right click save target as gets you an HTML file in .sh clothing because I don't know, some borderline arbitrary reason probably. Well, because it's a link to a page that represents the file that's part of the GitHub repo. I mean, I think I, I need to illustrate this. So if we go to if, if we go to like one of my projects uh, pages, okay, and let's just click on uh, json.config. This is not taking us to the contents of json.config. This is taking us to a an HTML representation of this page. I mean, it like it's literally taking us to the web page you're seeing right now. Okay, so that's why it it comes up as an HTML document. It's because that's literally what it is. Like for example, I mean, if you click on env.php, it's not taking you to that file. It's taking you to the GitHub page for that file. Now, if you click raw here, this will take you to the actual raw contents. So if you were to like right click on this and hit save link as, this would actually download the PHP file. But because all of these links here take you to more HTML pages, well, that's what that is. I mean, that's, it's that when you right click on any of these, it's going to download an HTML page. That's just how that works. And I feel like I should explain why it says core.sh here as well. It's because when you actually click on the link, the, the label of the link is core.sh. So it's going to try and save the file as whatever the label of the link is. You can also click code and hit download as a zip and it'll download the entire repo as a zip file. Um, or you can open your terminal and clone the Git repo into your file system. Um, but I mean, cloning it into your file system is, I mean, is for developers. That's how this is supposed to work. So yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that really doesn't matter, but I, I felt like I needed to explain that. The most notable issue I had was that my audio devices were just kind of screwy in OBS. Mm. My voice came across very unnaturally deep and it oh. sounded like my mic input had been duplicated. My voice just feels deep right now. I don't know if I've got something lodged or what. And yeah. Chat was pretty convinced that I had set something up incorrectly. And if I was a viewer of my stream, I probably would have said the same thing. But I've been using OBS for like six or seven years now. Yeah. So I had my doubts. That's not an OBS I problem. That That's a problem with Pulse Audio. And I'm hoping that within the next few years, most uh, Linux desktops are going to move away from Pulse Audio for something more like Pipewire. Um, Pulse Audio is notoriously weird when it comes to uh, devices. Um, I run into uh, audio issues all day, every day on Linux. Um, that's just how pi uh, Pulse Audio is, it seems. Um, I've had that specific issue. And um, what I have had to do is actually open up a config file. I'll put it up on screen here. And what you need to do is go in here and find default sample rate and alternate sample rate. Make sure that there's no semicolon preceding each line and set each of them to 44,000 100 hertz or 44,100. I've also read that you can change avoid resampling to say true instead of false and also remove the semicolon at the beginning. Um, I haven't played around with that setting though because that's what's happening. Your sample rate is being swapped um, for some reason. Usually it's because two different um, applications are trying to use the same sample rate at once. And so Pulse Audio is like, oh, I got you covered, bro. And it'll switch you over to a different sample rate, which is like insane. Like, why would that be the uh, the way that it works? But that's how it has happened. The way I've uh, fixed that is by changing this config file. Um, so I got you. I got you, Luke. We got this. No problem. All right. <laughs> I even streamed my OBS settings panel to prove it, but eventually feeling out of options, I just restarted OBS and yeah, that solved pretty much everything. Pamac is a program with a graphical user interface that functions similarly to the Pac-Man package manager that you operate in the terminal. At least it does once you find the hidden button in Pamac to search snap, flat pack, and arch user repository entry. Hidden button, it's like, it's in the, it's in the settings menu. It's not hidden. I mean, maybe, maybe it's different on KDE, but like on, I mean, that looks like it's using the GTK version, so it probably shouldn't be that different. I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't call it hidden, though. I mean, it's literally like you have Pamac open, and you click this, and you go to preferences. You have to type in your password, of course. And then you go to third party and enable AUR, 
and flat pack and snap. I mean, it's not, I don't think that, I don't think it's hidden. It's not, it's in the preferences menu. That feels a little weird to call it hidden. All right, whatever. It's basically like the pop shop from Pop OS, except it didn't try to brick my system the first time I used it. <laughs> Once I found the super convenient per application volume mixer in the bottom right corner. The interface is kind of kludgy, like mm -hmm. scrolling with your mouse wheel scrolls through both the audio devices and the levels of the individual devices, which is <laughs> not great. That's a, that's a KDE Plasma thing if I ever heard one. <laughs> but wow. other than that, it works really well and my first voice call to Luke went completely without a hitch. For me, the bottom line is what you're looking to get out of it. Just know what you're getting into. PC gaming already requires a certain amount of tinkering. I mean, there's a reason that more people game on consoles. You know, whether it's trying to track down save files in some Vista era folder or forcing an aspect ratio in an INI file. But a Linux gaming PC, it requires all of that crap and then another mountain of crap <laughs> on top of it. Yeah, honestly, that's mostly why I stick to Steam. Um, it's fun to like do Lutris and stuff sometimes, but like, it becomes kind of a mountain of hassle if you're doing anything more than just installing a Lutra script. Like if it requires any amount of tinkering, uh, I get kind of frustrated with it. So I can totally uh, relate to that. Like if the script doesn't work in Lutris, like the first go, then uh, I'm, I've already given up. You know what I'm saying? Like when something doesn't work, you can tell yourself, you know, well, I never wanted to use that functionality or I never <laughs> wanted to play that game anyway. Yeah. But Honestly, it just comes across as sour grapes. It is not that easy to use. No. The good news though, is that a shocking number of experiences don't start and end with, sorry, you can't do this. So stay tuned for part three, where Luke and I are gonna be trying to get as many games up and running this as no possible. Starting okay. with Twitch's top 20, and then expanding into some of our personal favorites. Mm. It's gonna be a really good one. Nice. Just like this message from our sponsor. Awesome. I think that was a pretty good video overall. Uh, I hope I didn't come off seeming a little elitist. I can fully empathize with what they're talking about here. I mean, I experienced basically the same stuff when I was the first Linux user. Um, but when I was first coming on to Linux, uh, it was a much more difficult and exclusive experience. Let me tell you, um, they have the benefit of having something like Lutris, which when I first started using Linux, did not exist at all. And wine was literally like you had to go to wine HQ and see if the app had a, a good rating or not. And if it didn't, then you were not going to get it running. Um, I mean, I, when I first started using Linux, MP3 support was still like a thing that was frowned upon by the community. Like you don't need MP3 support, uh, convert all your MP3s to OGGs. I, I, I'm a little envious of them because they have, they're having an easier go of it. Um, but at the same time, I learned quite a bit about Linux because it was so difficult and so arcane. Um, hopefully you enjoyed my reaction here. Uh, if you think that I added something and contributed something to this conversation, let me know in the comments below. I really appreciate you guys being here, you know, sounding off in the comments, telling me what you think. Uh, it really helps pick a direction for the future of the channel. If you believe in the work that I'm doing here and you want to help to support this show and help it grow, you can become a patron or a YouTube member with the links down below. I want to say thank you to those guys for being awesome and for being there and continuously supporting the show. Uh, it's because of you that I'm able to do this. So thank you. Uh, my neighbors are doing something upstairs and they're moving around. So I'm going to leave the video there, but thank you for watching and I hope you all have a blessed day.